Yay, here's some ideas about spouts. Hope this helps. Hi folks, so I'm gonna reiterate some ideas around spouts. I'm gonna start out with some hand-built ones and then cover the basics around a wheel thrown spout. So let's start with the idea is like, what is that vessel you're making? Are you making a Perone? Are you making a pitcher? Are you making a teapot, a coffee pot, some kind of ewer, a cruet set? Every spout has its place and they all kind of fit in differently and you can you can try them all okay um so i'll start out with uh this simple idea of you know just taking a coil of clay and in the joe Lijen video that i have on the gustif pottery channel on the youtube channel you can uh see her talking about spouts and there's like these ideas like the spout is curved that way the spout can be curved two ways, okay? And then the spout um, could be off the shoulder compared to off the body of the piece. So you got to look at what your influences are as a contemporary person or a historic person uh, that you're looking at. Uh, bring up Sam Chung and how he uses paper templates along with Deborah Schwartzkopf, who also does... Um, there are so many influences. John Gill is a great influence to look at his older pieces that were these interesting spouts that a lot of times people start with that paper. And, you know, I'll recover that if you want to see that again, but um, I already talked about that. But this idea of this simple uh, coil spout where you're going to find the center of that coil with, this is a shish kebab skewer. Um, you all should go make some shish kebab, get a wooden skewer, and open it up by rolling against it. Or we all have some kind of tapered paintbrush that works well too. Make sure it's you know clean. You don't want it to be painted, but if it is, then that's all right. You know, it just works better if it's unpainted wood. Um, so if I kept opening it up with this, that would be fine. This could work too. Most of you have some kind of tapered paintbrush handle, so, and it doesn't have to be tapered. I'll show you that. So rolling against whatever's in there and then taking what's in there and pulling it um, towards you. Sometimes you need to have the surface a little wetter so it, it's sticking. And you see how when I'm pushing down on it here, it is kind of expanding it um, to a level. You can open it this way too. So you're mainly expanding this end rather than that end, more, more it rolls against it, if that makes sense. And remember with all the spouts, no matter which spout you're working on, you want extra clay. So I'm probably only thinking about in between my fingers as the spout and then this area is going to be cut off later. The cool thing about this kind of spout is I can take it while it's on the dowel rod, the shish kebab skewer or the paintbrush and I can roll it over a texture and I can get a nice surface to it. So, so there's that simple idea. Um, you can of course expand it to a larger uh, one and open it up more and more um, you can you can do that as you roll it or you can move it to different size um, paint brushes or dowel rods or pieces of wood so after I get it I can think about the curve I may be wanting out of the spout and kind of gently coercing it into this kind of curve um, if I'm looking at the spout coming off of something, I might look at it that way. And so um, I'm going to let it set up a little. Then I'm going to decide on the placement on the body of the piece that's pouring. I might cut um, a curve. So if it's a curved surface, I might cut that. And then this area I'm going to score and slip and add 
I have to think about the end of that spout too. So I'm going to cut the end of the spout. And what I really like doing is cutting it on to, of course, if I've already curved it, it's harder, but cutting it against something on the inside, such as that paintbrush or that dowel rod. So then I'm not collapsing the circle of that. So I have this kind of idea. I'm going to refine that hole a little bit. Look at that hole. It needs some work. Um, I might thin it out a little on the tip because if it's thinned out a little on the tip, then it pours a little better. So we'll talk about that with uh, this beak or um, kind of tongue spout that I'm going to show you next here. All right. So we'll go from there to the next spout. So with the beak kind of spout or tongue spout, we could look towards Iranian um, oil vessels that usually sometimes the wick would hang out in this spout. And I've shown you some of that maybe um, in the slideshow. Um, but you're, you're literally making this kind of shape of uh, a tongue sort of. And you can think about a curve this way, depending on how it's attaching, or you can cut it afterwards, like I said. But it's this edge here that I'm going to thin out. I'm going to work the edges after I've cut that shape to make sure they're round. So I'm going to get my fingers slightly moist. I'm going to um, work it while it's still flat, and smooth that out. And I may also thin that little point out that you see there. So this little point, and I might just pinch it like this. We'll show you this kind of pulling of a spout on a pitcher. I'm going to go like that and thin that out before I go and I curve it into the spout shape. So curving it into the spout shape, I could think about a already rounded object to lay it on, or I could do it in the air, um, like my fettling knife, if I take it like that, maybe... On a smaller one, it would work better. Very much like using that dowel rod or that tapered paintbrush. Um, it's a good way to start it. And I start looking at it and, you know, looking at how how is that fluid going to go through there, the trajectory of it. Um, and I have the option to close it up, and I'm not going to do it on this one, um, where I can take the edges and make them meet and have an opening here. Um, I'll do that on the throne uh, spout uh, that's based off of a, a saucer. Uh, Josh Deweese did that a lot. And I think I showed you a Josh Deweese piece where there was a, a saucer that was thrown and then folded up to make the spout. Anyway, you start closing this in to think about that trough like area to be where the liquid comes out of the piece okay so another way to think about this is also to enclose it with another um, piece of clay so if you cut a piece of clay somewhat like this you could think about again you could curb it or keep it straight um, one of my teapots i think in that 500 teapot book uh, has a spout like this uh, really kind of look at those those resources to figure out what kind of spout you might be wanting to make. But see how I curve that? And I'm going to work this edge. Then I'm going to have to score and slip there and score and slip on this and put it together something like that. And I won't bore you with the scoring and slipping, but I will. I'll put this together and show it in the end. So it'll be a spout like that. So that's kind of the tongue or beak kind of spout. And again, a good source is uh, some old Iranian pieces. Those are some of my favorites. Um, as a contemporary person to look at, Jeff A. Strike's um, pieces were some of my favorite first ones with, that I saw with beaks. So now I'm going to move on to um, an idea around using what's called a slump mold. And a slump mold can be made out of a variety of material, but this negative shape is going to be cut out of a piece of cardboard or wood and you can do it on a larger scale 
And then I'm going to lay it on top of some kind of negative space, uh, maybe even a, a bucket or the box itself that I cut that off. I'm going to have to flip it over to do a side A and a side B. Um, I'm going to take that slab of clay and I'm going to drape it in there and I'll show you how to do that next. So one thing you think about is how much clay you need for this technique and you don't want to have too much clay and you obviously want to have enough clay so it doesn't fall into this hole. It's got to hang up on the edges and so what you cut out of it happens to be a good idea to use as a template to cut um, that slab of clay to the, you know, about the amount of clay you need. So I'd like to say maybe a half inch or so, depending on when you're slumping, how much you're going to have go into that cavity. So I'm going to lay that on there. I'm going to think I need this size. I'm going to lay that on there, and I'm going to cut around it um, at about maybe a half an inch. And that just gives me an edge of the clay that I can kind of manhandle. Um, and uh, allow it or coax it to go into this negative space. So I'm going to lay it on there thinking about that edge. And again, you know, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll hold it up in the air to show you. Um, but the idea of having a bucket um, or a box under it, it's easier to not have to worry about the mold. But to show you how one thing that I do first is I'll lift that up and I'll allow that to go in there without doing any kind of pressure. And then it gets this kind of nice, um, starts to become this on the other side, it becomes this nice, smooth, uh, gradual thing. And then the other thing you can do is use um, a sponge that's dry, not a wet sponge. You don't want to get it really wet and you gently push on that sponge and that sponge disperses the weight rather than using your fingers disperses the weight of your pressure evenly into the clay so it goes into the cavity in a nice um, gradual way if you use your fingers you can get into tighter spaces like in this area where the spout is tighter um, if you don't cut the clay to that size like I'm saying then it's almost impossible to get it in here and leave those edges lifted like that after I feel like it's kind of close I might lay the edges down and further coerce it in either with my thumb really gently so I'm not poking at it or um, that sponge you can use a wet sponge at this point so you can slide um, in there and that gives you um, pressure that's more evenly dispersed also and what we have is a side A done now and I have to do a side B um, and then they come together so these two forms if you look at how much it's come out of the clay there that's the depth if I want to try and match the other one I'll do that Normally on larger pieces you leave it in the mold a little, but for these smaller pieces you can take it out and then gently put it down onto a board and let it stiffen up into a leather hard or um, less than leather hard consistency. And then you can cut this area here where you see the line. And if you see that line there, that just tells me exactly where to cut that piece. So I'll cut A and B out. And I'll be scoring and slipping and I'll put them together and I'll show you that in this next step. Okay, I've got these two pieces cut out and now they're scored and I'm going to put them together. Uh, and sometimes you just think about how to handle things and you want to handle them a little more delicate, you know, if they're wetter like this. And we'll put those two pieces together and make those seams get all fixed up and gently after you get them all the way around first you may go back in and do a lot of uh, kind of detailing to that edge and again I'm closing it up as a hollow object and 
I'm going to cut this off later to join to the body. And I'm going to cut this off later to open it up. Right now it's not a, you know, opening for a spout. You need to pour out. But the idea is um, pretty much something you could translate into how you might make candles too. Again, if it's a hollow object, um, you're going to have to have a hole in it somewhere. In this case, to pour and to be connected to the teapot. But if you thought about a handle uh, with this technique, you could um, approach it that way uh, by just having a small hole underneath the handle or something. So this technique can be used in cooperation with that first technique I showed you by using a paintbrush and a, a coil. You could think about how you can have a tube on top of a slump mold and uh, play with it that way. The last hand-built kind of spout I'm going to show you is a quick uh, reiteration of the first and then a different way to look at that uh, technique where instead of using a, a, t a coil to make that tube, you can use a slab to wrap around it. Okay, so I'm going to show you that next. So I've got this slab here. Again, I'm going to clean this up and work this joint and really clean that up before I am ready to um, attach it to the pouring vessel. All right, so I have, um, well, actually, I'm going to go with the slab first. So here, I've got this slab, and I've kind of tapered it a little narrow here. You can wrap something around whatever you're doing. This can be at a much larger scale or at a much smaller scale. I'm going to take it, I'm going to lay it on top of there and lift that up and then use that to start to curb it and wrap that slab around it. The clay can't be too hard when you're doing this or it's going to crack when you put it into that curve. When I get to the point where those two come together, I have the option to either, if the clay is wet enough, to just use pinch, pet, pinch pot kind of technology where I'm just pinching that clay together at that joint. And as I pinch it together, I'm going to then get to the very end and then use the, the dowel rod or the paintbrush. If I'm using a paintbrush, I'm going to want to get it wet if it's painted like this one was. So it slides in there. But this joint needs to be fixed from the inside also. What's cool about having this dowel rod on the interior is that it's a hard piece of uh, wood that I can then put against the table, fix that joint down a little, and kind of roll it on that joint and move it back and forth. Sometimes that is enough to fix that joint, okay? I can look in there. If it's a big enough piece and short enough, I can get my fingers in there and work that joint also. So there's this other thing I can play with here. After that joint is fixed, I can sled it out and I can call it done. And I can angle things. It doesn't have to stay round. I can turn it into a square. I can bop it into a square. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but you could like think about making it a hexagonal or a square. You have this tube now, and you, you think about what can I do with that tube before I bend it or cut it up to make the spout parts. One thing that I, I like to do sometimes, uh, especially on like watering cans with large ones, is to pull it. Very much like when you're pulling a handle. So I'm going to close this top part off because I'm actually going to cut that off. Then I'm going to get it above my bucket of water, and I'm going to pull it. Now, some people will pull, and I'll show you that with the other one, with the dowel rod inside it. And then you're kind of pushing against that interior. Um, I'm going to close the bottom off, too, just so that seam doesn't open up. So you're going to pull it and you're going to get a different quality from it because of how these lines from you pulling it start to affect that surface of this tube. And you can taper it down and make it a tighter spout than maybe the original 
dial rod that you use. Now, the issue with this is, is that as it comes down and tapers in, yes, the clay gets thicker. Um, so when you cut it, you go, ooh, that's too thick, or hey, that's not bad. And you can thin it out a variety of different ways, but you don't want to go too far with it. So after I feel like I've got it to a point where I like it, I might bend it into the curve that I, I'm envisioning coming off that perone or a larger pouring vessel that would have a taller, longer spout like this, okay? So that same technique from the first one that I showed you, where you take a, a coil and you have a nice, nicely rolled, either tapered or straight coil, and this is kind of, I remember learning to make tatami bricks. It's really similar to making these conical bricks, but I'm going to push it all the way through. I have that. And it's that same technique from the big, the small one that I showed you with the shish kebab and the paint brush, but I'm going to have a longer one. And I do like standing when I do this. So get to pull it towards me now, open that up. Now I have this tube that, again, I can pull it. I can do very similar things that I did with that last one to this. Um, what's kind of cool is to think about how you can have things angle. So if I cut this angle like that, and then I reverse it, I can make these hollow tubes. And it could be for, again, spouts or handles, but we're talking spouts, but you start looking at how you could get kind of architecturally influenced by this or other ways to think about hollow um, objects and then those angles could be then rejoin it to go this way and it's something to maybe like just make some and play with it to get a sense of where it would go of course you're going to then score and slip that area and put it together okay now i'm going to discuss um throwing spouts um first i'm going to throw something off this little piece of clay that's going to be a little um saucer sort of a little plate that i'm going to fold up and again reminiscing on uh one of josh deweese's pieces that i've shown you um uh, and that's just another way you can think about that tongue spout but instead having a thrown element that you're going to use so i'm going to do that first i'll just go ahead and get a little slab, kind of thrown slab. And so you're gonna get a quality that's going to be different than if you use the slab roller. So you can have the movement from the wheel showing up in it and the lip that you can throw is a little different than what you might actually uh, do on a slab. So. I'm going to maybe use that idea of that center. I'm going to think about this lip. And I'm going to keep it upright because when I make it into a slab, I'm going to throw it a little. So I'm going to split the lip like I was making maybe a flange lid or something. But that line is going to um, flatten out a little in to make the spout to have sort of a it's almost like a flange lid I'm making, but you can play with the slip anyhow, any way you want. You know, just trying again to think about how this area is done on the wheel. It's going to give you a different um, quality than you could achieve any other way. So I'm going to cut that off. I'm going to use the point of my rib. It's going to give me a place to wrap that wire tool around it. Remember all the basics of throwing off the hump. All are to be employed okay now I have this slab and I'm just gonna kind of throw it aside over here let's stiffen up and talk about it later but while um, while that's stiffening up I'm gonna talk about this basic idea around throwing the spout now remember that out here the wheels going somewhat um, three, four times faster than right here, you know? So you do want to think about the speed of your wheel helping you, not hindering you. So 
you hear maybe hear my wheel going a little faster but it's going faster and I could throw probably throw five spouts off of this piece uh, depending on the size of the spout so that's the only reason why you throw off the hump and you just center this little part and that first pull is just fingers trying to be conical shape don't let it go out um, Second pull, the same thing. Maybe I'm creating that gullet where the spout connects to the pouring vessel. So down here, I'll make, use my needle tool to draw a more distinctive line. Down there might be where I'm gonna have it, part of, part of it cut off, but attached to that uh, pouring vessel. Um, and then up here is where it's gonna taper in a little little thin so I'm gonna try and uh, cut a little piece off first check that thickness because I don't want it to be too thin and I don't want it to be too thick as to like choke off the liquid so I'm gonna have that piece there and some people will use a throwing stick as I mentioned before their fingers um, your fingers are only you know so big around and so if you want a narrower um, spout in here, you're gonna have to use your needle tool or a throwing stick and you can throw against that. I'm just gonna do a simple, uh, small teapot spout here. Use my rib to kind of hone it up a little. And I like it to be sort of tapered right there and then open up and then close back in. If it, if it, um, tapers and then just opens up, you have a spout that kind of gurgles and doesn't pour very well. So it's nice to have a spout that um, kind of tapers. Down in this region here, the, the liquid's a lot more of it. And as it comes to that taper, it speeds up. And it comes to here, it's gonna slow down a little. If you want it to speed up more, then you would maybe have this not flare out at all. But if it flares out too much, if this area here flares out too much, that's problematic. It usually makes for a very um, gurgly, bad pouring spout. All right, so um, how to get them off is a variety of different ways, but I like to use my needle tool until it cuts through, and then I lift it up like that, turn the wheel, and then I put it over on my board. And that's the simple of thinking about how to throw a small uh, one. You want to throw a larger one uh, it's all the same thing if you're going to throw a larger one it's going to be um, exactly the same but it's actually going to be a little easier because your fingers if you're going to throw a narrow one like i said use your needle tool or something instead of your finger on the inside and then if you want to throw a taller one your fingers only so long so again using a dowel rod or a throwing stick of some sort to be able to get it to taper and to get it up. That's the simple of, of throwing a spout. Now I talked about pulling the spout off of a piece for like a creamer and I did a larger uh, pitcher for you all too. Um, if you want to see that again let me know and I'll do that in class but I'm going to re um, uh, iterate some of the issues around this. Again I think when you first do this that you should do it not on the wheel um, until you get a sense of it. But I'm going to do it on the wheel uh, for the purpose of this demo. Um, you're always going to think about, for a little creamer or a pitcher, the spout's going to be seemingly a lot larger than you may think. So I'm going to take probably an uh, inch and a half or so of this lip, and I'm going to start pinching and tapering it. And I, I like to do it on the wheel a lot because I can do it at a wetter stage and I can pull up on it and I can get a very much like when you're um, pulling a handle I can get this quality where it tapers and it comes to more of a point and if it's a more of a point instead of a rounded lip it does seem to pour better of course it chips more too after I've got it moving upward I may moisten my fingers a little some slip
It's a lot, again, like pulling a handle. You're slowly moving that clay upward, and you can see how it's it's going upward. It's also um, getting a little bit of a curve, but right now from here to over here, it's closer to you. It tapers from the thickness of the lip to a thinner spot back to the thickness of the lip. So I'm going to get above it now with the camera and show you what it's looking like. So it's not much happening here. So I'm going to get above here and try and do this at the same time. Um, the next step is then to kind of do this kind of softening of that and smoothing out of anything. And it looks really dumb now until you do this last part where you push it in like that and maybe swipe it one more time. So that's kind of a basic idea around a pulled pitcher spout. Idea of a thrown saucer kind of spout. So you see some throwing lines in it and then this ridge. Um, so I've stretched it out. I've just thrown it back and forth till it got more oval rather than round. And then all those same things that come into play that I showed you with the beak spout, maybe using a, a rounded uh, form to start it could be a way to think about how this kind of slab would be different for a spout than the slab that you would hand build. Now in that one DeWeese piece, it was actually put together more like this edge here and this area here would be joined and then it would be opened up at the end for the pouring. So I'm fixing the joint on the outside first, and then I might go on the inside and seal it up with a soft coil. Um, and this is one way to think about how you might use a thrown element. And again, the throwing lines are reflected in here. There's these curvatures that you get. There's this edge here. Um, how you play with that saucer before you do it is going to be dictated in that final result. Again, thinking about how after it's set up, I might cut this kind of curve where it would go onto the belly of a pouring vessel. It's a different way to approach that same thing with the beak spout, okay? So I'll just show you a little rehash of the ones that I just went over. Again, this one is the, the, the idea of a thrown kind of saucer. And then thinking about the curve that it might go on, on all of them. Um, this is that beak spout, which is really similar um, to that first one there. This is the, the molded spout. And you have to think about, you know, whether you keep it ovalized or rounded. You have to think about um, that attachment area again, um, where it's going to join it. This is the first one with just a, a shish kebab skewer. And then I rolled it over the edge of the counter to do this um, surface work to it. You have to think about what you can do um, when it still has a, a, a dowel rod or paintbrush or something inside it. This is the one I said I wouldn't square and then I squared it. So just like thinking about how you would sled over the surface with your fettling knife or a rib and squaring it off. You can think about squaring a spout or maybe for a handle also. This was the thrown one. I'm just draw this line on here. Again thinking about where I would be cutting it off to attach it to Maybe a teapot. And this was the pulled pitcher spout, just showing that little creamer idea. Again, I play with that on a larger scale for, you know, that tall pitcher that I did in the in classroom demo. Um, and these might be like the way you think about uh, a quick way uh, to pull a spout or make a spout. 
this bout could be joined to that if you think about how you might incorporate a beak spout onto a pitcher form. So the ideas are kind of endless and where you go with it, it'll be kind of fun for you to think about um, what kind of spout to employ for your piece.